Um, okay, yes, so we're trying some new technology here, which will hopefully alleviate some of the issues with the small board that we had yesterday. Um, but again, speak up if the technology is not working for you, whatever it might be. So just to sort of remind all of us where we were, since it's first thing in the morning, we're working this, with this notion of differential privacy, this epsilon or epsilon comma delta parameterized notion of privacy. Again, this is a property of an algorithm, a property of a mapping from database space to outcome space. And it says that how this mapping behaves is very constrained. And in particular, for any two databases that differ in just one person's information, and any subset of the outcome space that you might be interested in, we have to behave nearly the same, meaning we have to put nearly the same probability mass there, and nearly the same in the epsilon differential privacy sense is we're allowed this multiplicative e to the epsilon factor, nearly the same in the epsilon delta sense is we allow ourselves the multiplicative factor and also an additive delta, just to sort of remind ourselves where we are. And so yesterday afternoon, after getting familiar with this definition, uh, we got to see a couple of first algorithms that achieve this goal of differential privacy. So we ran this randomized response algorithm and found out there are a lot of cheaters in the room. Um, we learned about the Laplace mechanism, a way of doing direct noise addition to a numeric answer or a vector of numeric answers in order to preserve privacy. And then at the end, we had this report noisy max algorithm. And remember, the uh, motivating story there was uh, we wanted to find out what's the most liked page on Facebook. And so we were trying to find the best amongst a set of alternatives. And so that is finding the best amongst a set of alternatives is the jumping off point for today. So maybe you want to do something with your data that's non-numeric. Maybe you're in a situation where adding noise doesn't make sense because you're trying to pick a social policy. You can't pick the best one and add noise. Um, or maybe you're in a scenario where your output is numeric, but adding noise to it would just be a bad idea. So Imagine, for example, I, I decided that I'm going to try a new way of making some money. I'm going to start pricing access to videos of my talks. And I'm trying to figure out how I should price access. So let's say there are just three people who are interested in watching this talk. It's probably not too far off from true. And uh, let's say we have two of them, A and B, to whom it is worth a dollar. And we have one other person who's willing to pay a whole $3.01 to see this talk. Is that visible? That does not look very good from here. I can change the color to white. That's more visible? Indeed it is. OK. We'll learn together. Um, OK, so 301. And, and so. If I just knew this, how would I set the price for my talk? I'm going to set a post a price and people are going to come and buy it. If I, if I just knew how much people valued it, I would set it for 301. OK. Another option is I could price the talk for a dollar. Three people would buy it. It'd be slightly worse uh, for me. I'd only make $3. But what if I got my price slightly wrong? For example, what if I priced it at 302? For example, I computed the best price and added some noise to it, and you know, half the time I came out on the, on the high end. How much money would I make? Zero. Zero. OK, so there are natural scenarios where even though the thing you want to do with your data produces a numeric output, you can't just add noise to that output and expect the solution quality to remain reasonably good. So we have some concern that the tools that we've developed so far may not be sufficient for applications of interest, either because we might be interested in generating an output that's non-numeric, or because we might be generating numeric outcomes 
where you can't just add noise and keep solution quality. So this is where the idea of the exponential mechanism comes in. And basically, this is another way to look at this report noisy max approach to selecting amongst a set of discrete alternatives. Sort of a slight generalization of how I uh, presented things before. And so the idea here is that we have some set of discrete alternatives that our algorithm could output. And we're going to output an element in the, the range of our mechanism with probability that's proportional to this thing that's a little bit hard to parse. So what's going into this? We have the epsilon, that's our privacy parameter. We have this utility function or scoring function that I'll come back to in a moment. And then the denominator, we have two times the, the sensitivity of whatever the scoring function is. So what's a scoring function? It's just a function that given a database and a potential output for my algorithm is some measure of goodness, of accuracy of that outcome given that input database. And now I'm allowed to design that scoring function however I want. And then once I've designed a scoring function, that instantiates the exponential mechanism as a way of picking outcomes given a particular database. So think of this as basically what I'd like to do if I weren't worried about privacy is pick the outcome or an outcome with the highest possible score given the true database. But I can't just do that. That would obviously not be differentially private. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick amongst the possible outcomes in a way that biases towards the good ones. Um, and one way to sort of think about this is you imagine sort of placing the outcomes, you know, sort of on the line, on the real line, based on how good they are with respect to the particular database that we actually have at hand. And then instead of just taking the max, you take the noisy max. Basically what you're doing is you're putting down some noise around these and you're you know, sampling from these distributions and then you're picking the one that comes up as the max. As it's basically what's going on here. And so this is a way of selecting amongst an arbitrary set of discrete alternatives once you define the scoring function. So it turns out, sort of not surprisingly, given that we've seen something quite like this before, that the privacy proof is going to be pretty straightforward. But we'll go through it again. I think it's good for us to see yet another proof of differential privacy. Well, it's going to be a little less obvious as we instantiate this in various situations is what is the accuracy theorem going to say? And how good is the accuracy of this algorithm going to be? And intuitively, this is because no matter how I set my scoring fun function, the way that I'm sampling, because it has this dependence on the sensitivity of my scoring function, I always get privacy. Whether or not I get a good accuracy theorem depends both on whether I've picked a smart scoring function and whether or not that scoring function is able to concentrate enough probability mass around the good outcomes versus the bad outcomes. And that's a trade-off we'll see shortly. So questions while I'm here on what we're trying to accomplish or the basic idea that we're looking at now? Yeah. Perfect, yeah. So what do I mean when I say sensitivity of the scoring function? Great. And so what are the things that are neighboring um, in this comparison? So the things that are neighboring are the input databases. So there's also the type of right, right. So, so we're going to be looking you know, for, for fixed T, for fixed outcome. How much can the score change when we move between neighboring databases? But yeah, that's it. Because now we have two inputs to our function. It, that, yeah, that was not obvious. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, so this is the, the worst case. Yeah. Yeah, so other questions, clarifications at this point? Okay, good. 
So we're trying to select amongst a set of discrete alternatives, and we've got this sort of exponential uh, biasing towards good alternatives where good is defined by the scoring function that we get to pick. Okay, so what we'd like to show first is that the exponential mechanism that we have here preserves differential privacy. So I heard a question. Thank you. Uh, I can do this on the board <laughs> if necessary. The computer went to sleep. Okay. Oh, the computer went to sleep. Is there a way to prevent that from happening? And now we're not synced. I see something different on my screen than up there, and we also have some feedback. And iTunes is I try to open. I <laughs> it's not my machine. I, I have no control over here. I, I warned everyone that we're, we're All right, one problem solved. Is that right? Because then everyone has a Mac person agrees that's the right thing to do. I believe you did the right thing. We'll find out in 20 minutes. Okay, so 20 minutes to find out, huh? All right. And I have to start a new recording. Get rid of that. Apologize, Apologies, everyone. Okay, great, we're back. So we'd like to prove that this general exponential mechanism, regardless of how we pick our utility function, gives us a guarantee of epsilon differential privacy. So let's try to do a proof on the slide. Um, so again, we know how these proofs start, right? So we're gonna consider databases X and Y. Is this visible, legible? Yeah, okay, great. Um, we'd like our X and Y to be neighbors. And we'd like to pick some arbitrary outcome of interest. And what do we wanna do? We wanna look at a ratio of probabilities. What are the probabilities that we wanna look at? Well, we wanna look at the probability that our exponential mechanism, when given X, returns R versus the probability that our exponential mechanism when given Y returns R, okay? And now it's gonna get a little bit messy looking for a minute, but let's, let's just work through it and see what happens here. So what's the numerator here? Well, we have a ratio. So what was our exponential mechanism? Our exponential was mechanism said sample prob with probability proportional to this. So now let's sort of substitute this in, quite literally. So we've got x of epsilon, whatever our scoring function is when applied to x comma r, two delta u. And now we've got this sort of unfortunate denominator, which is the sum over all of the possible outcomes of this same nice function, x r prime, two delta u. And now we also have a denominator. And this looks remarkably similar, except with y. And you might be saying, why is she even bothering with these normalization terms? They look like they're about to cancel out. Why am I bothering writing all of this? It's not because I like to write and write and write. What, do these normalization terms actually cancel out? Not necessarily, right? What's the difference between them? 
One's got an X, one's got a Y. And so potentially, our scoring function is going to behave a little bit differently in um, these two cases. And so the, the sum in our denominators of, of our, our two pieces here is not necessarily quite the same. It should be close though, right? Because we have some bound on the sensitivity of the scoring function, right? So fixing an R of interest, an outcome of interest, if we move between X and Y, which are neighboring databases, we understand how much our scoring function is allowed to change, right? Okay, so now here's where we really test my abilities here. Add a page, and let's see if we can continue this where you can still sort of see what I was doing. Okay, so now let's rearrange this a little bit. So we've got over here our former numerators, two delta u, and x in terms of y, two delta u, that was a u, and now we have these annoying normalization terms. So the r prime, x, epsilon u, y, r prime, two delta u, and r prime, x, x, r prime, two delta u. Is this still legible? Yeah, reasonably so, I think. Excellent. Okay, so now, now what? Well, again, we have a really limited toolkit. What could we possibly do here to try to understand better what's going on? Well, we, we basically, we have the sensitivity. We have this bound on sensitivity, delta u. So let's plug it in. Um, how can we plug it in here? Well, let's sort of do this a, a piece at a time. So this is less than or equal to what? So let's plug it in in the, the numerator. So this, because of our bound on the sensitivity, this is less than or equal to u of y r plus delta u. Oops, that did something I did not expect. And what can we do over here? Well, something very similar. So today's the lecture of getting, me getting to write lots and lots. R prime plus delta u. 2 delta u. I needed some parens around here. And same thing as before. OK. So now what? Now I've got things that look like they might cancel. What's going to cancel for me and why? And again, the iPad doesn't have the right time, so I'm going to grab some of the timekeeping object. So what's going to cancel for me and why? Thoughts here? Well, let's just try this first term. This one's a little easier to look at. How are things going to cancel here for me? Got exponential of a sum. So let's pull out the thing in the numerator that looks a whole lot like the denominator. And so what does that first term turn into? I'm patient. Epsilon over two. E to the epsilon over two? Okay. Agreement? Okay, so let's write that. Now the second one is a little harder to, to look at. What have we got going on here? Yeah, good. Okay, so, so again, I've got the, this exponential of a sum. Pull out in that the, the piece that looks the same as below. 
and and then we have this remaining e to, sorry e to the epsilon delta u over two delta u. That we can pull out because it's the same across uh, all of our possible outcomes. All of these are our primes, and so we have another e to the epsilon over two. Are we done? I see yes. Why are we done? It's symmetric. OK. All right. Exponential me mechanism preserves epsilon differential privacy. So we now have this general exponentially weighted sampling technique that lets us select amongst a discrete set of alternatives. And all we have to do is we have to pick a scoring function, and we immediately get a private algorithm. Boom. So we have a new sort of block in our toolkit. What do I owe you now? Accuracy. accuracy. Yeah, we did privacy. What about accuracy? So I warned you accuracy was going to be a little bit more messy in the sense that it's going to depend on how well we can concentrate probability mass on good outcomes. It's going to depend on our smart choice of a scoring function, right? So let's, let's see what we can do here for a general type of accuracy theorem. Uh, but accuracy is generally the part you have to think about when you're instantiating the exponential mechanism. OK, so the theorem that I'd like to show for you, and I think I don't have it uh, for free, so let me write it for you, is you know, fixing an input database x, I'm going to let r opt be the set of optimal outcomes. So those r's that, given x, maximize my scoring function. And then what I'd like to claim is something bad will happen with my screen. Um, that what I'd like to claim is that the probability that the, I can keep writing for a minute, it's okay. Uh, that the quality, in terms of my scoring function, of the output chosen by the exponential mechanism is going to be much worse than the opt. And what do I mean by much worse? Well, something that's a little sort of annoying and hard to parse. But here, let me, how do I do that? Uh, so the, my much worse terms, let's get them in here. We'll make sense of this in a moment. We'd like to claim that the probability of this sort of failure, failure to get a good outcome, is not too big. So this is my theorem statement that I'd like to make. And so basically, what we're saying here is when I run the exponential mechanism, the probability that I, through this exponentially weighted sampling, pick an outcome that's significantly worse then best, given the scoring function that I've picked, is not too bad. But the significantly worse part of this uh, statement has this dependence here on a few important terms. There's the epsilon from our privacy. There's the delta u from the sensitivity of our scoring function. And there's the log of this ratio of the number of possible outcomes that we're considering, that we're sampling amongst, and the number of optimal outcomes. And it shouldn't surprise you, because I warned you that it's, it's sort of a question of how well we can concentrate our probability mass on good outcomes versus on bad outcomes. That's what we're going to see here. OK, so let's try to do this. OK, so let's try to understand the probability that we output an outcome using the exponential mechanism that's worse than some c. All right? So we'd like to upper bound this probability. 
And once again, we don't have a lot of tools at our disposal, so what are we going to do? Well, what's sort of the worst case for us? In some sense, the worst case for us is that we've got one good outcome, and all the other outcomes are sitting right there at C, waiting to be sampled. That's, that's the worst situation for us. So let's understand the, the probability that we're going to pick something bad, something of quality C or worse, um, in that situation. So what is that going to be? Um, so we've got, in the numerator, the probability that we're picking something better than C. In the denominator, the probability over everything that it gets picked. And what I was hinting at is that, well, this is just giving us I just miswrite something here. No, nope, I think that's right. Okay, so probability, probably that we pick something that is better than C is this ratio between the, the probabilities that we have, the probability mass that we have on, ah, sorry, better than or less than, which did I mean to write here? Sorry, probability that we pick something worse than C. Ah, good, okay, probability that we pick something that's worse than C I was saying better, I, I meant to write right, worse, and I actually wrote it good. Okay, so the probability that we pick something whose uh, utility, according to the scoring function, is worse than C, sorry, is this ratio uh, between probability we're picking something worse than C and, and sort of the, the total probability. So this is just... In the worst case for us, All those bad guys are waiting there with score C, waiting to be picked. And our one lonely good guy gets a score of opt. Right? And so, what is that? Let me just put these things together so they look a little easier to parse. So basically, now we're done. If you plug in your appropriate C, you'll get exactly, here, let me go back to it, the theorem statement that we wanted here. And so you can see, I wish I could show them at the same time. This is one failure of my small board. Can I make this also? can shrink it. Technology. All right. Can't shrink it anymore, though. Um, I can circle it and shrink it. Oh, boy. I can circle it and shrink it. Let's see if this works. Not with the pen. Not with the pen. All right. <laughs> I'll learn how to do that later. <laughs> okay. But what I wanted to show you was, okay, I... So now if I take logs over here, you can see how, you can't see because you can't see them at the same time. Sure, yeah, if you can shrink it so that we can see both of these at the same time, that would be great. I'll learn something new in the process. All right. Is any of that legible? Oh, okay, cool. So now we have, good. All right, so now we can see together um, how we can achieve uh, this sort of bound uh, where we have our sort of uh, failure, how can I point to this, uh, this sort of 
this term is sort of representing for us I, the extent to which we're failing I, to be close to getting a good outcome. Okay, so we have this sort of very general statement. Um, and typically, as I was saying, you know, all you know is that you have at least one optimal outcome. So a, a, partic a sort of typical, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Ah, sure. Let's so let's go back here. So you're saying this the step from here to here. Great. Okay. So so I was saying in the worst case all of the outcomes, well, except for the one optimal one, but I sort of count I overcounted by one when I was when I said uh, cardinality of R. All of the outcomes are just sitting there at C waiting to be picked. Because what I'm trying to do is avoid picking something that's, that's, a, that's worse than C. They're all just sitting there waiting to be picked. And so the worst case for me is that we have cardinality of R items of score C. And we have, well, however many we have, optimal outcomes of score opt. So for me, that's the worst situation. And like I said, this is, you know, this is a bound that's a little hard to interpret until you instantiate it in a particular situation, a particular scoring function. But this is the, the general kind of statement that you can make. And what I wanted to say now is that uh, frequently you only are, know that you have at least one optimal outcome. And so frequently we actually write this instead of with a cardinality R opt with just a one in its place. Okay? All right, so now we have privacy, and we have accuracy for this exponentially weighted sampling. Okay, so why might we use this? We'll see it in a number of ways over the course of the week, but it's gonna fall asleep again, okay. Um, so one story for why we might be interested and this is as a tool, comes sort of from the, the motivation that we, that we had yesterday, um, which is, well, yesterday we were trying to figure out, in some sense, first how to answer a single query with differential privacy, and then how to answer more and more queries with differential privacy. And right now, there's, so let's think about it a little bit. We have basically Laplace noise addition that we, we understand in terms of uh, answering queries. And basically, if we want to handle k linear queries with the guarantee of epsilon differential privacy, and we're going to get an alpha beta accuracy theorem, what is our alpha going to look like? Well, it's going to look like from that sort of union bound at the, the end of the one of the lectures yesterday, um, that, that, that the yeah, alpha is going to look like log. Let me write, you know, we have an alpha is log k over beta, sensitivity of f over epsilon. But that sensitivity of f grows as k. And so basically right now we don't have the ability to answer very many queries because our error is going to grow like k intuitively. So what we'd like to do is ask the question now, can we potentially an answer many, many, many more queries about a database? Can we potentially answer exponentially many rather than linearly many queries about a database? So what's the story here? You have, again, this sort of motivating medical uh, records database, and you potentially would like, for the purposes of medical research, to maintain all sorts of fundamental properties of this data before you release it or release private versions of the answers to researchers. So you want to know what's the correlation between weight and lung cancer. You want to know the correlation between age and lung cancer, smoking and lung cancer, weight and smoking and lung cancer. You want to know all sorts of things potentially a very rich 
set of things about your data, and you'd like to preserve them all accurately. And the question is, can we do this? And so, th if you think about it for a moment, it's, it's clear that there's potentially many, many queries of interest of this form that are still linear queries that would be very useful to maintain about our data. So stepping aside for a minute, uh, sort of a point that I wanted to raise is that in my mind, data can be big in it, at least two dimensions. There's probably three or four. But the, the two most salient at the moment, I think about sort of the rows and the columns. So for us, again, rows are one row per person. And intuitively, data that's rich in rows, that's big in terms of rows, is easier for privacy because we have more people. And so the ability of an individual to shift a typical sort of robust aggregate statistic is reduced. On the other hand, when our data is rich in the column sense, when it's, we have a lot of characteristics of each of these individuals encoded in our database, privacy becomes harder because potentially there are many, many more queries that we would like to preserve. And so there's this sort of important distinction to make when people say that they have you know, big data or a lot of data. It doesn't immediately tell you whether or not this is you know, good news for privacy or bad news for privacy. If they have a lot of people in their data set, that's great. If they have very rich data like genetic data, they've potentially got a problem. Okay, so the idea though that we'd like to follow is somehow to leverage some underlying structure or overlap between the queries that we're interested in on a database. So as an extreme example of this, what if we asked the same counting query over and over and over? Now if we treated this naively, what would we do? The Laplace mechanism would add fresh, you know, mean zero noise uh, to each instance of the query. And so the noise would grow with K. Um, and that would be to avoid uh, sort of having the mean of the, the noisy answers converge to the true mean, um, which would violate privacy. But obviously, this is not the right thing to do. If you see the same query over and over and over again, you shouldn't answer it afresh over and over again with more and more noise as the number of instances grows. You should just get the same answer. And so intuitively, maybe if we think hard about how to reuse answers and reuse noise, if we take advantage of, the, of a structured set of queries, potentially there's room to do much better than this sort of linear degradation. Won't that feel compositional if you have two different databases answering that can't be synchronized in terms of their answers? So. Yeah, so, so we're thinking about right now answering questions in a centralized fashion. Uh, so we're thinking about a situation where there's a curator who has a database and the, the story that we're about to tell is that there are a set of queries of interest that we'd like to maintain on that database. And for this morning, we actually even know that set of queries in advance. For this afternoon, John will tell you about not even knowing that set of queries in advance. Um, and we get to think really hard about how to answer all of those queries in a sort of holistic fashion uh, to simultaneously get privacy and do well on all of them. But you're right, I mean, if somebody's holding data over here and somebody's holding data over here and they're not coordinating and they don't have the ability to share randomness um, and, to, and, and to synchronize, then you, you can't do something like, like what we're about to do, yeah. But, but intuitively, if you are in this position of power where you hold the data and you are answering the queries, then maybe there's something you can b do that's better than just naive Laplace noise addition. And so the, the hope is that instead of getting error that scales with k, we could get log k. Okay, so as I just hinted at in response to this question, um, for this morning we're gonna be in the sort of offline case. We're gonna be producing what I'm gonna call synthetic data. So I'm gonna take this database to think of you know, sensitive medical information, and I'm gonna take 
a set of queries of interest, potentially a very, very large set of queries of interest. I'm going to think very hard, and then I'm going to produce something that looks like data that I can release to the research community. That data release of synthetic data is going to be done in a differentially private fashion. So once I release that data, it can be used forevermore by whoever wants to use it because of uh, sort of the post-processing guarantee. There's going to be no potential for privacy to be degraded, uh, just you know, no matter what people would like to do with that data, no matter what sort of outside auxiliary information they come with later on. And somehow this, in, this synthetic data is going to, in some sense, succinctly encode the answers to all of those queries that I was interested in. Um, so, like I said, the sort of appeal here is this is something that I can publish once and for all, and that I can sleep well at night, and research can proceed. The catch is that research can proceed so long as the researchers want to answer queries that I anticipated, and that I made sure that my synthetic data answered well. If there are queries of interest that I did not anticipate, the researchers have no guarantee of accuracy. They can run those queries on my synthetic data, but they might get the wrong answer. They won't violate privacy, but they might not learn anything useful. And so that's the kind of guarantee that I'd like to give today. And then th this afternoon, uh, we'll see how to do something in the online case. Okay, so the basic idea here is really, really simple. So we saw the exponential mechanism is a way of sampling from amongst a discrete set of alternatives. And what I would like to do is to create synthetic data. So my set of possible outputs of my algorithm is going to be synthetic databases. And I'm going to use the exponential mechanism to sample from amongst a set of candidate possible synthetic databases. And the exponential mechanism is somehow basically going to bias me towards synthetic data that does well for my queries of interest. And in fact, does well for all of my queries of interest. In order to get a guarantee of this form, we're going to need to know that there exist small databases that answer all of my queries of interest well. So what's the intuition for this? Well, because I like to be able to say, <coughs> I sample a, a synthetic database, and that encodes all the answers, there better at least exist a synthetic database of some particular size that encodes all of the answers to my queries of interest. And so once I have that, the last step will be just to show that I have sort of enough probability mass on good synthetic databases and not too much probability mass on bad synthetic databases while simultaneously getting privacy. And that's sort of an accuracy theorem for the exponential mechanism. OK, so I said I'm going to instantiate the, uh, the exponential mechanism. So I need a utility function. What's my scoring function going to be here? Again, it's actually quite simple. So again, so a scoring function has these two inputs. The first input is the true database. And the second input is a candidate output, which for me is a candidate synthetic database. And how am, am I going to score a candidate synthetic database given a true database? Well, it's going to be with respect to the, the set of queries of interest, which I know in advance. So I'm given in advance a potentially large set of linear queries of interest. And the way that I score a candidate output database is I say, hey, let's look over all of these queries of interest and see on which of these queries my synthetic data gives an answer that's as different as possible from my true data. And I'm going to score that synthetic database as a candidate output based on that worst query of interest. Okay? And so your score, the, the way I'm going to write it is your score is negative max over the, the set of queries of the difference between what the candidate 
uh, synthetic data says and what the true database says, okay? And so I mentioned we're gonna need some statements that, that says there exist small databases that encode all of the answers to all of the queries well. We don't have time to prove a theorem that looks like this, but it's a standard learning theory type of results, these sampling bounds that basically say that for any uh, database of interest and any collection of linear queries, there exists synthetic data uh, of size log of the size of the class of queries over alpha squared such that the worst query when evaluated on the synthetic data is no more than alpha off from the true answer. So all of the queries are with an alpha of the correct answer. And the way you prove this theorem is actually kind of cute. You actually show that if you just sample from your original data that you get I, that, you, that with some probability you get a, an outcome, the, a sort of candidate synthetic database that answers all of these queries well, and that shows for you existence of such a database, okay? And so the basic idea is that as long as you have log Q over alpha squared data points, it is possible to encode the answers to all uh, cardinality Q of the queries of interest. Okay, so we know that there exist small databases that are good. The question is, can we find one in a differentially private fashion while still giving sort of a good, good accuracy guarantee? Okay, so what's the, the picture look like here? The picture is, okay, so we have this original database of medical records. We do something very inefficient. Let's talk, let's hold discussion of any computational efficiency for a little bit. So we sit and we think about all databases on the order of size log Q over alpha squared. We think about all possible databases of this size. And for each of them we say, what's your score? Well, your score is Worst case over the queries of interest, how much do you differ from the answer returned by the true underlying database? And then again, forget about computational efficiency. We somehow sample according to these scores. So again, we do this exponentially weighted sampling where we bias towards a good candidate synthetic database of this small size. And again, I, our sort of bias, I, that we're allowed to push towards is gonna to depend on the sensitivity of the scoring function that we've chosen. So that, that'll show up in our analysis. And that's the algorithm. You just use the exponential mechanism and the scoring function to sample a good candidate synthetic database. Okay, so the hope is that this is gonna allow us to handle an exponential number of queries. Let's see if it does. So this is a little bit more formally the algorithm that we're using here. So R is our you know, output space. These are databases of size log Q over alpha squared. We do this, here's our scoring function, we do this exponentially weighted sampling. So what's the privacy proof look like? This is the easiest privacy proof we've done so far. We proved it already. When did we prove it? It's an instantiation of the exponential mechanism. Done. Done. This is great. Because once you have building blocks, you can start to use them and you don't have to do these proofs over and over again. Okay, so I warned you, the, the harder part is accuracy. Um, what are we gonna do for an accuracy theorem here? Well, actually, we're pretty much going to instantiate this accuracy theorem that we, 
that we already had. So let's just sort of think a little bit carefully about what we can say for accuracy. So you'll notice, perhaps, if you're paying very close attention, that I'm doing something that I warned you about yesterday, which is in particular, I'm changing the notion of privacy in neighboring databases ever so slightly. Um, and I'm talking about databases of a fixed size. And for me, a neighboring database is going to be one not in which I've added or removed an individual, but I've allowed one individual to change her information. You can redo this particular proof in the sort of more standard, more general uh, framework that I introduced yesterday. It's just a little bit messier. Um, so I hope you'll allow me this as long as I admit that I'm doing it and I tell you that it's all right. Um, you, can, you can look at the appendix of the paper if you want to see the, the sort of additional step, which is basically you need to, in a privacy-preserving way, determine the size of the database and then use that. Um, in, in subsequent computation. Okay, so what do we have? Well, what's our sensitivity of our scoring function? How much can this scoring function change? Right, so what was the scoring function again? So the scoring function was, well, negative of the max over the queries of interest of how much can the uh, a, of the difference, sort of worst case over these queries, of how different the uh, candidate output data is from the true database. Okay, so what does it mean to talk about the sensitivity of that scoring function? Good, so somebody reminded us, well, what is the thing that's changing when we're trying to figure out the sensitivity? It's the true underlying database. So fixing a candidate output database, so some candidate synthetic data, and changing the input database by changing one person's information, how much can my scoring function change? How much can any of the queries change their answer? Well, by at most one over the size of the database. Okay? So we have a bound in our sensitivity. And now what can we say about our opt? I'm gonna claim that there exists a potential output, a candidate output database, with quality at least negative alpha. Why can I claim that? Well, remember, how, do, how did I pick my candidate output databases? I picked them to be of size log number of queries over alpha squared. And I picked that size precisely because that was big enough, according to these learning theory type sampling bounds, to guarantee that there existed a database of this size, such that it got all of the queries of interest correct to within alpha. So I know there exists something that's at least negative alpha good. I'm doing this sort of silly negative scoring thing, but forgive the negative scores. So there's at least negative alpha. Okay, so now I'm just going to apply my exponential mechanism utility theorem. Um, that's supposed to be theorem with t equals log 1 over beta. And given the time, I'm not actually going to write it for you, but it's really plug and play. That's, this is really all we have to do in order to get the guarantees that we want. And we'll see that, the, that this basically almost immediately gives us this guarantee that except with sort of this failure probability beta, that simply instantiating the exponential mechanism with this simple utility function where our outcome space are these small databases that are where we're guaranteed to have at least one good one, um, is sufficient to guarantee that we're going to get all the queries correct to within alpha. Or sorry, to, wi uh, to within alpha plus this thing that's hard to read. Um, okay, and so you can sort of do a re 
rewriting of this, this previous theorem, which again, I don't quite have time to do for you, but this is really just sort of manipulation of terms in order to get this theorem that says I, that there exists this algorithm now that lets us answer using synthetic data, lets us produce synthetic data in a differentially private fashion that answers all of our queries with this accuracy guarantee. And so the cool thing for us, sort of given where we started this discussion, is that term. So before we were really concerned because we were aggregating error that was growing linearly in the number of queries. And all of a sudden we're seeing logarithmic dependence in the number of queries. So this is a big win for us. And so the, the bottom line from today's lecture is we have this really cool sort of very general purpose tool in the form of the exponential mechanism uh, that lets us sample from a set of discrete alternatives and one particular instantiation of it is allowing us to simultaneously answer exponentially qu many queries and produce synthetic data for it. Now, just because I've got to sort of be fully honest, now we did this in a way that was completely computationally inefficient. Um, and the question of sort of computational efficiency is going to be a theme that we'll return to in, in later lectures, and we'll think about how we might improve the bounds and the performance of this type of algorithm. The other note that I wanted to give you is just, um, if you're familiar with VC dimension and thinking about things sort of from a learning theory perspective, feel free to replace that log, the size of the class of queries, with the VC dimension um, in the statements that I gave you today. All right, that's it for now.